te wai he mea nui ki te iwi katoa, ki te iwi tangata, ki nga ahua tanga katoa, ingari um, he hono nga nui ki, ki, ki a ngai taewa te iwi Māori nga rua he nui i nei kia koutou katoa, i nga koutou. So today, yes, I'm going to talk briefly about wai, uh, water. Uh, wai has a, a, a special significance for all cultures. Um, why is extremely important for survival. Uh, on the priority list, why is tuarua, the first being air. Uh, we can do two minutes without air, but we can only do two days without water. Uh, we can do two weeks without food, but definitely uh, without water there is no life. Um, so when you go to a place, if there is no water, you can't live there. Animals can't live there, people can't live there, so why is essential to our survival. But for us Tiwi Māori, why is also a symbol of our, of our identity. We all whakapapa to why, we all whakapapa to a moana, to an awa. When someone says, no, uh, when you do your pepeha, you usually start off with your maunga, uh, Auraki te maunga, waitaki te awa, and next you would mention your awa uh, or your moana. So it's very, very important. I have heard people say, when people say ko wai kwe, um, it does mean from whose birthing waters do you uh, originate from or descend from. So uh, that's a very spiritual thing. Te wai, kia mato, kia tato, te wai maori. Um, I'll just try and change, how do I change the. Um, Okay. So, like all things Māori, to us, uh, papa has, sorry, uh, Wai has a whakapapa, um, and in this little rota rota here, ko taua Wai, ko pōtere ki te moana, ko hāpai ki te rangi, ko tau ki runga maunga, ko heke ki ngā riu, ki ngā wā, a kaoki atu ki te moana. So that is uh, the, the water cycle as um, Māori see it. Um, how the water descends from the heavens, touches the land, and then that water flows into the valley, into um, creeks. These creeks eventually flow into rivers, and these rivers will eventually uh, reach the sea, and that will continue onwards and onwards. Um, if you look at the Papa, the Papa came from Elsdon Best. Um, so I'm only guessing, but it's probably coming from uh, a two-hoy source, um, and it talks about the fucker pop of why. So we all know we go back to Te Wehinga, and we also know that after Te Wehinga and after Te Pakanga Ana Atua, uh, the rain is seen as the tears of sorrow from Rangi Nui, uh, desperate to be reunited with his wife, uh, Papa Tuanuku. And the mist in the mornings are the tears of Papa Tuanuku that ascend into the sky. Uh, it's also a tears of sadness. Um, so that is one of the origins of water or white. Um, another, so if we were to look at this uh, Whakapapa chart, we have Rangi Nui, and then all forms of rain falls, what we call precipitation. So that could be in the form of rain, that could be in the form of hail, uh, snow, and sleet, and such. And these are under the domain of one of the primal atua ihorangi. Ihorangi um, being the, the atua of precipitation. So as the water or the wai falls to the ground, it is under the domain, the domain of ihorangi. But once this water touches the whenua, then a transformation takes place, and this water is now uh, seen uh, to be under the tutelage or command of para whenua mea. So once the water touches the land, it is imbued with earthly qualities and becomes para whenua mea. But as you can see in the whakapapa, there's the whakapapa of para whenua mea is tāne matua, the father, Tane, the father, or the parent, Kamui Ia Ia Hine Tu Pari Maunga, the 
the, the Mountain Maiden, I guess they call her, the Mountain Maid, and then they have Parafinua Mea, who is the Atua of Wai on the land. Um, so you can see from a from an, an from a, it creates an image of the water of the the rain falling from the heavens as it reaches the mountain made and Tane, the water descends to the valleys and the creeks under the domain of Parafinua Mea. So Parafinua Mea, to my Tawati Maori, or most of the iwi, is the atua of water on the land. Um, as you can see in this whakapapa as well, is that haere tonu nā whakapapa. So in this example, Parafinua Mea had two husbands, one being Pūtoto, who was said to be her brother, and the other one being Kiwa, uh, who is the lord of the oceans. And so within this particular whakapapa, ka moia parafinua mea ia pūtoto kāpota ko rakahore. So they are the parents of all rocks. Ka moia rakahore ia hene uku uku rangi kāpota ko tua matua, who is the parent of all stones. And this whakapapa goes on. Um, oh, pūtoto, as you can see, is magma. So there's that connection. So there's some sort of whakapapa connection between water and rocks. There's another whakatoki that goes, Kāre e haere a parafenua mea ki te kore a rakohore, which means water cannot run without rakohore, who is the who is bedrock. So without rakohore, water cannot flow. So that's whakatoki shows the importance of whakapapa and how um, every generation can support the one above. Uh, there's another whakapapa lineage between parafenua mea and kiwa, ka moia, Together and they beget many, many different types of shellfish and many different types of seaweed, in particular the shellfish that are attached to rocks. So there you see that connection between parafinua mea and rocks. And also uh, where parafinua mea heads out to the sea at the river's mouth, that's where a whole lot of her progeny is at the river mouth and such. So there's that connection as well. Uh, Kiwa also, to many, has another wife, uh, Hene Moana, um, and some believe that Parafinua Mea and Hene Moana are sisters. So as Parafinua Mea, so as she goes out to sea again, she greets her sister and her husband, then she's transformed into the clouds again and starts her cycle uh, once again. So koia tērā, te whakapapa o te wai. Kia ora koutou. Uh, here's an image of the Toi Tangata team, um, and these were writing in the sand, as was one of our student interns last year. Um, it's a real belief amongst us that if we are going to learn about the atua or the domains, the best place to, act, to learn them is probably not the classroom, but to be in that domain themselves. And here, one of our student, uh, student interns was writing a particular whakapapa uh, regarding white. As you can see, we're at the the um, tātahi at the beach, and the tide is low. Build up. So, from a, just a scientific perspective, water is an amazing uh, compound. H2O, two hydrogens, and uh, one oxygen. So. Water is unlike any other compound in the world. For instance, uh, it can be found in its three states of ice, uh, liquid, oh, solid, liquid, and gas in the one spot. No other um, compound can do that. Its, its solid state is actually less dense than its liquid state, which is really, really unusual. Usually when it turns to a solid, it becomes more dense, but not water. And the repercussions of that is huge because what that means is ice floats on water. If you can imagine if it wasn't that case, then ice would form where it's coldest on the bottom of the ocean and then no life, would, on a very cold day, no life would exist if uh, ice should form at the bottom of the lakes, rivers and, and oceans. So it's really, really important. Uh, it is a universal solvent which means things dissolve in water and if you can imagine our blood, uh, which carries oxygen, which carries all sorts of um, nutrients. If that didn't happen, um, we couldn't survive. So it's really important that things 
dissolved in water. It has an amazing heat capacity. So you can imagine uh, when we go to the beach and it's really, really hot and you can hardly walk on the sand because the sand conducts heat very, very well. But then you get to the water and it's still chilly because the sea is absorbing all of the heat from the sun, which allows has an amazing uh, buffering effect. And that same effect is in our body. So if we didn't, water wasn't absorbing heat, when we go for a run, we'd probably just die because our, our heat, uh, our amount of our body's heat will just get so hot that it will be unsustainable to support life. Uh, and then that, probably the other really important thing about water is that every uh, molecule sticks to each other. So, so if you can imagine H2O is a, a pyramid shape, hydrogen has a negative charge, I mean, a positive charge, oxygen has negative charges, the positives and negatives stick to each other, and that gives water that sticky um, property, and that allows water or our blood to pump throughout our body. So water is an extremely unique compound, uh, absolutely essential for life, and for us who are involved in the the sector of sports and physical activity and recreation, that is only then that we realise the absolute importance of water. Um, just to, give, to go back a little bit, we're going to talk about some of the definitions of why. Um, this, these definitions come from Naitahu. So we actually, in Naitahu, who I fuck up over too, we actually had a bunch of criteria and definitions for why. Uh, which we have koha to the rest of Aotearoa. I can't speak for other iwi, but we have various definitions of why. For instance, why Māori is our word for fresh water or drinkable water, um, and that is a definition for a particular type of water. We have why tai. Uh, why tai is our word for seawater. Obviously, you can't drink seawater, but why tai is very, very important in terms of um, um, that's where a major food is for us. It's in the way we travel from one place to another back in the day. So white Thai, Thai being salty. We have another word called Wai Kuru Thai, which is the water at the mouth of the river, which is kind of salty, kind of fresh. It's that that mixture. Uh, we have white Tapu, where white Tapu was the water that we used for a particular body of the awa or creek which was only used for ritual, so you could never clean in that water. Um, it was used for rituals such as uh, tohi and karakia and such. We have wai ora, which is a particular type of water known for its healing properties. Uh, where I live, uh, uh, where I grew, grew up in a place called Whakatū, the top of the South Island, there is a river called Ari. Well, we call it Ariwaka, but its actual name is Ryuwaka. And the Aikina Kōrero, back in the days of Polynesian explorers, they knew they would travel all the way just to bathe in these waters for its healing abilities, including uh, Hui Terangiora, a very famous Polynesian navigator who actually was the first person to Antarctica. He went there just to bathe, just to revitalize himself. And it's for that reason why the Golden Bay area to this day in Māori is known as Waitapu, because of that particular spring of water which was known to have amazing healing powers. Uh, we have another um, uh, word that we call Waimate. Waimate, uh, can, there's two versions of Waimate. Waimate can be a particular branch of, the, of an awa which was known to be too dangerous, so don't allow your children or um, people to swim there because it's they may uh, find themselves in deep, deep trouble. Uh, waimate is also another word for stagnant water, water that does not run, water that is unclean. Uh, for this reason, uh, do not drink. So the word that I'd like to introduce today is waikino. Now, this is a particular cultural term where the water, the modi of the water has been altered through pollution or corruption and has the potential to do harm. Yeah. 
until I find call contact. Sorry, I'm just hearing um, something go through my mic. Oh, wait. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, can you hear me? Hi. Hi. If you've got your microphone um, on and you're talking, um, that's not me. Can someone turn off their mic? It's uh, it's polluting and corrupting. Kia <laughs> <laughs> So just go back to Waikino. The ammonia of the water has been altered through pollution and corruption. So the ammonia itself has been corrupted. And that has the potential to do harm. And when we think about water like that, what kind of why has the potential to do is my modi has been corrupted and has the potential to do harm. Well, we often think about here we have Wairuru Tapu, some beautiful clean water. Then you add sugar, you add colour, you add flavour, you add preservatives and you add more chemicals. And what do we have? Well some people would call that Wairika, uh, some people would call that Wai uh, Coke. Some people might call it Fanta, but basically the modi of that water has been corrupted. It is no longer able to sustain life as it did in its natural state. So this is a term that we would like to, to use for fizzy drinks and uh, sugary drinks. Is um, yeah, So this is something that we like to use for fizzy drinks. Maybe using the word Waimate is a bit severe, but we want people to stop using the word Waideka and start using the word Waihuka. Call it what it is. Um, these type of drinks have in the past and still continues to cause harm on our people. It has, this modi has been corrupted and it causes harm. So, you know, those fizzy drinks and sugary drinks that, that those, those, Things that you get from the warehouse and you buy in a dozen, these are waimate. This is um, waikino because that harms our people. Anyway, um, ko huki mato ki te kaupapa of physical activity. As you can see in this image here, there are three um, contrast, contrasting images. So in the first image we have a group of toi tangata whanau heading out into the snow. So it'll pay to my Naito who has actually got a number of different words for different types of snow, different types of frost, different types of water. So it'd be really be interesting into doing research on those. But as you can see, on the ground is hook of papa. So water is in a frozen state. But when you're in that environment, your breath come is comes out, you can see your breath, so your breath that, that water comes out in a gaseous state. Um, and then you can see all the water that is frozen along the row of the of the plants. So it always pays to be um, cognizant or aware of the various forms of water and where it is, not just in the environment but on yourself too. Uh, for instance, when you're in that environment, what you don't want to do is let yourself get really, really sweaty and then stop and then that, because of the cold environment, that water then drains out your heat and then it becomes very dangerous. So there's just some of the things that we learn in certain mountaineering courses and outdoor courses to always keep your temperature uh, at the right amount so you don't sweat too much so it doesn't end up uh, biting you later on in the day. And then in the middle image as we can see uh, a bunch of toy tangata whanau. Geez, they're lucky they travel all over the country going to amazing places. As you can see though it's rather brown and barren in the background, so this is a tohu that why is a lot more scarce. Um, those trees are telling me that it's probably autumn, um, and I'm probably missing. Is that where is that? Root bird. Root bird. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and as you can see, but in this instance, when you're sweating because of the heat, it is not so so bad. But then you have to be aware that you need to replace those fluids, otherwise uh, you can get dehydrated. And here we have, um, on the third image, um, some of us on waka, on the water, on the ocean. 
as you can see, there's water has a um, what's the word? A character which can change on a daily basis or even an hourly basis. But as you can see, called muddy note white. So in that respect, it's rather safe, uh, but still care needs to be made. Uh, on top of the, the sea, uh, once again, you can be sweating quite a lot, so it's really important that you have water sources on you to keep you rehydrated. Uh, if you go into seawater, because of the nature of seawater, that it's high concentrations of salt, it actually draws the water internally from you out into the ocean. And so that's why when uh, we are in the sea for a long time, we become very thirsty, and the opposite occurs when we're in the river. Actually, water goes into you, uh, which is why if you've been in the lake or rivers long, you actually feel like a mimi quite quickly as it enters your body. Uh, here's another set of images. I guess the important, the, what we want you to take from these images is to always be aware of why, not just uh, internally, uh, in terms of our own uh, hydration, but also to be more aware of the why that is around us all the time and remembering the fact that all three states can exist in one setting uh, if you are lucky enough to see that or be aware of that. Just take a look around. Okay, so um, when we're training, um, we need to be aware of our hydration. Uh, the kupu Māori we use for hydration is whakanā. We need to be aware whether, um, there's this old saying like when you're doing endurance, if you are already if you are thirsty during your endurance events, it's too late. Uh, so you need to be well hydrated before uh, you exercise. And what you don't want to do is drink too much straight before or during, otherwise that can give you the stitch and things like that. Uh, but a signs of hydration is obviously thirst. Thirst is not the best one though, because thirst out of all our different senses is quite slow. Uh, our mimi is another, if you have dark yellow or even worse brown mimi, that's a real uh, good tohu that you are um, dehydrated. If you suffer from headaches not only during exercise but uh, throughout the day, it could possibly be a sign that you are dehydrated. Uh, upset puku is a really common occurrence for those on endurance uh, events when they don't have enough water. Uh, the skin, the largest organ of your body, is another tohu of how hydrated you are if they become dry and listless and your lips start to become dry and cracked. That's another sign that you are dehydrated. Uh, con losing concentration and focus could be just how hard you're going in your event, but that's another sign that you don't have enough water in performance, I guess, if you can't, for some reason, can't perform at your the level that you're used to, uh, hydration could be a sign. Mm -hmm. um, I've just been told that if you're dehydrated by just as little as 2%, it can affect your performance by as much as 20%. So that little figure there just tells you how important uh, water is for us uh, during exercise. So how can we use water? How does it impact on our mori when in exercise sports? And when do I... So probably one of the more important things is that you stay rehydrated throughout the day. Um, leading up to any event, whether it's endurance, whether it is inter intermittent power exercise like uh, rugby or rugby league, you need to be well hydrated before your event. Um, we also need to be consuming wine during the event. So really, really important that someone's in charge of the drink bottles um, so that we can be hydrated through the event. If it's an individual sport, then Pat, and you're not part of a team, that's something that you're going to have to take responsibility for yourself. And there's also some really important um, things about water after the event as well. 
So we're just going to take this opportunity for people out there to give me some examples of how water can improve or revitalize or repair you or, or speed up recovery around water. So what are ways, what are things we can do after the event where water can uh, improve our recovery, our recuperation, our repair? Like okay. doing Are the, um, oh, yeah. uh, I was just going to say, like, um, not in terms of drinking it, but doing the cold baths and ice pack things. Okay. Yeah, take a day. We, we call that cold water therapy, yep. Yeah, after a really hard out uh, training or event or game sports, I do know like at the professional level, straight after they do cold water therapy, where they have a large bath full of ice, and you jump in that. You've got to be pretty disciplined because it's freaking cold. <laughs> <laughs> jump in there, um, yeah, and then you come out for a while, and you get back in, and you come out for a while. What are ways if you don't have access to a large bath full of ice or sometimes I've seen them use 50 gallon drums or even blow up, they've got these blow up baths that, that they've used. What else could you do to replicate that cold water therapy? Mm. 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 Good. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> uh, what we were told to do uh, back in the day was when you have a shower, put it on cold for like 10, 15 seconds, then put it on warm for 10, 15 seconds, and then just repeat that about six to eight times. Uh, and that's probably not as good as the ice water itself, but it's a good um, substitute. Anyone got any other ideas about the how why can recuperate ourselves following an event? Anaru? You listening, Anaru? <laughs> yeah, we're listening. Oh, kia ora, kia ora, Anaru. So you just finish a, finish a game of rugby? What type of liquid are you drinking straight after your game? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just um, mine's more of a prep thing. Pre, yep. pre, like a more of a prep, drinking plenty of water before the actual game, and during the game and plenty of water after. It just helps with keeping you hydrated through the whole game, rugby, right? or if you're playing in CrossFit stuff. So I do just drink a lot of water before, during and after. Good point, good point. What about, has anyone ever thought of steam? What steam does for us? So that's another um, version of water, how it recuperates us. Use the paddling pools and cold shower. Mm. Actually, reckons um, when you have the flu. Yeah. Have you felt? Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. So there's probably there's the there's the sauna, and then there's the steam room. I guess the sauna. Uh, it's so hot, it basically gets you to, to sweat your own liquids out, but in that context, it's getting rid of a few of the, um, the waste and toxins that you have in your body. Mm. Um, and then what you do is replace that water by drinking some more. Uh, probably that's not a game day thing. Um, in fact, definitely not a game day thing, but that could perf be perfect for the next day thing, eh? Mason, can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Um, I see uh, a few people like after a hot day, uh, like uh, doing long runs, they just grab the old cold bottle of water and just whip it over their head as a cooling down process. Is that a good practice? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, basically, the body is in a is, needs to be. It, our body internal temperature is 37 degrees. If it gets to 39, you're like close to uh, being uh, very very sick. If it gets to 40, you kind of gonna die. So <laughs> it's really putting water on your body is a great way of dissipating that heat that comes out internally, especially on a hot day or especially on a uh, humid day where the water can't evaporate off your body as efficiently, then putting cold water on, on you is a great way of cooling down. Yes. Kia ora. Kia ora. Yep, so talk about steam room. Um, I've, there's a there's a other bunch of ones out there. There's these things, of, they're called, it's called a Scotch shower. I, I've only seen them in Europe, but they let water fall from a height. It's like, it's like um, being under a waterfall, and as that water falls on you and beats down on you, it actually is like a full-on uh, midi midi white. So that's one that I can remember. And um, I was just showing just before that I've got this thing called a it's called a sensory deprivation tank. And what it is is they, it's really highly concentrated in salt, so you float on top of it. And it's blocked off all sounds, so you can't hear anything but your heartbeat. And you, and because it's at your body temperature, it's like you're floating in the air. And apparently, I'm not not that I've done it, but it's supposed to be pretty trippy. But you get put in a in a trance-like state. So this is going to do it next week. Ah <laughs> 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 boy. And everyone knows uh, when you're when you're hungover, just jump in this cold water. Eh? Great for you. Ah boy. Uh, any other portal? As you can see there, there's these are at the hot water pools, the hot beach pools. Um, that's where's that one? Oh, that's in the Coromandel. Yeah, yeah. Is that in the um? Oh, hot water beach. Oh yeah, awesome. And of course, oh, we've got another comment. And she said in Europe they have thalassotherapy, similar to a full-on mini mini and different shower types. Um, and then the systems also like the floating tanks. Uh, uh, she also wrote flotation tanks are becoming quite popular. Quite popular, yeah, yeah. So Europe is the one, and I guess uh, just in, so someone was saying that they've got the many different types of white therapy in Europe. Um, and also, I guess we've got our own way hot pools in Rotorua and all around. In, you know, New Zealand got them all over the place, actually. Natural heated pools. Uh, something about when you're in that hot water, it really allows um, those muscles to relax. And uh, definitely don't do it before a game but, uh, or before an event, but after an event, they're very, very relaxing and therapeutic. All right, so uh, we're just going to talk about some of the, the science. Oh, we've actually really discussed that, but you need to after you do your event or whatever it is, you need to replace the water that you uh, sweated out, and it can be up to what's that? Replace 1.2 to 1.5 times the amount of weight you've lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what professionals do before an event is that they actually weigh themselves and then they weigh themselves after the event and then they can work out the amount of water that they need to replace. Uh, just on, um, during, if you use sports drinks during your event, they need to be around, four, was it, 4 to 6 percent uh, in concentration with glucose or sugar. Uh, any higher than that, that slows the absorption of it. So there's two different types of sports drinks. There's a sports drink that you drink during your event and there's a sports drink that you drink after the event. Those small sweeter ones that are higher than 6% are only for after the event. And that is mainly to replace the glycogen in your muscles. But those sports drinks that you have during the event, the ones that are 4 to 6% concentration, 
they're mainly to replace the water so your body can absorb the water more quickly with that small amount of glucose in there as opposed to afterwards you want the glucose where you have a higher concentration. And any sort of sugary drink can do for that. They don't have to be the expensive um, sports drinks. But what we would really, really recommend is that those sports drinks should only be given to high performance athletes. Uh, at any particular, even at a teenage level, those sports drinks aren't necessarily. Water is all you really need until you really get to those top echelons, you know, at the very height of sporting achievement is when you really need those sports drinks. Um, oh yeah. And the other thing that the sports drinks have is a small amount of sodium because when you sweat, uh, it leaches out the salt. Basically, it's salt that sits within inside you that comes out. So that needs to be replaced. And electrolytes, which is elements such as magnesium, sodium, chlorine, a whole bunch of stuff that comes out during your sweat. So that's pretty much what the um, sports drinks have. But in saying that, you just have a big, for most of us, just have a whole lot of water and a sandwich or a whole lot of water and a meal, and those that salt and that electrolytes are replaced. Uh, no need for flashy sports drinks at those lower levels. Certainly when you're playing competitively or you're, or you're um, doing long events, then they're not necessary. And probably uh, we forgot about the old ice when we get injured. Obviously, rice, rest, ice, compress, elevate. Lovely. Uh, it's something a really important uh, protocol that you use once you're injured. Uh, hopefully that only happens very rarely, but by doing that you speed up the recovery process. Um, some of us get a little bit lazy, but if you want to get back on the road or get back on the game, uh, the RICE protocol speeds up the healing process. Hot springs, bar shower, we will talk about that. Rungoa, nearly all the rungoa, rungoa we take, you need the medium of water for the good, for those healing properties to transfer, whether you consume it or whether you make a poultice. Uh, generally, you need some type of liquid for in order for those healing properties to pass through the skin me membrane into your body or you drink it. Uh, so water is a major medium for uh, healing in itself. Water by itself if you guys ever want to to do a little bit of research, there's a Japanese guy called Masuru Emoto, Masuru Emoto, and he, they, the Japanese follow a religion called uh, Shinto, and they believe water has a conscience, and it kind of makes sense because you can do a karakia and make that water whatever that karakia was supposed to do to that water. So you can make a karakia to make that white tapu, to make that holy water. You can do a karakia on that water to give it the healing properties. Um, and he did uh, some research where he would make water crystals based, he would do a karakia on, um, say, a glass of water, turn them into water crystals, and then he would show that they were beautiful water crystals. And then he would do um, hate words like hate or um, kill, and then those water crystals that formed were um, either they didn't form properly or made ugly looking crystals. Um, and there's been a lot of research on that, and according to them, water has a conscience. And if you understand tikanga Māori, um, you would understand that through karakia, we actually transform the water to do what we're wanting it to do. So. That's another side of wairua, you know, uh, which I'm not going to talk too much about today because uh, I'll leave that for little for the kumatua. We have some more questions. Oh, we have some more questions. From Makuni, how does hot water relax your muscles? How does hot water relax your muscles? From what I understand, especially like if you've been doing some hard out exercises that you get quite a lot of toxins and lactic acid crystals 
um, that form with you know right in your muscle and around the cells in your muscle. So when you heat it up and you heat those muscles up well above the 37 degree of mark, that increases the blood flow to those areas. And as you increase the blood flow to those areas, it allows uh, an avenue by which to get those toxins and that lactic acid build up to be dissipated from the muscle um, through vasodilation. That's correct. <laughs> um, so that is one reason why the hot water um, relaxes the muscle. Um, I remember doing something real stupid one day and I actually had a, a spa before a rugby game and I think I had like one of the worst games of my life. It just the, the muscles couldn't get going. They were too relaxed. So don't ever do a hot water before a game. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's probably the main reason. But obviously if you're in say the hot pools in Motorua, there's a whole bunch of minerals in the water as well that can aid in the uh, revitalization and recuperation as well. Next one. Um, is rara and salt okay to use in place of the sports drink? Is rara and salt. I have, uh, when I did with the university, people were doing that and they would, and if you get the concentration right, it's probably the best way, well the cheapest way of making a sports drink. Um, and I think um, Jess might be able to hunt down. Uh, yeah, Jess is, can hunt down how to make your own sports drink using just a pinch of salt um, and using Raro or something similar to Raro. And don't forget, there's two versions. There's the one you use during the event, which needs to be really, really uh, low concentrations, and then there's one after the event that's higher. But yes, correct. You can use Raro and salt. Or a cheap version of a sports drink. And to jump on that, um, Moana was asking about um, coconut water. Coconut water as an electrolyte. So there's, when I say there's two sports drinks, there's probably a third one which they call an ISO. Uh, ISO meaning the same, so it's the exact same concentration as your blood. Uh, that would be no good during the event because it would slow down the absorption and you'd probably want more after the event. So ISO is probably what you drink just throughout the day. Uh, so in that sense coconut water is an ISO drink because it's the exact same osmolality as your blood. In fact I've used it for um, a plasma, like if you need to be hooked up to a plasma uh, bag to replace fluid, but you can actually use coconut water. So in that respect it's good. Uh, for me personally, the price doesn't work out for me. Like it's quite expensive. There's a hundred different ways you can replace those those solutes. A lot of cheaper way. But if you've got the money, uh, I don't see a problem with it. The coconut is an amazing plant with some amazing properties. And uh, if you get, yeah, as I say, if you've got the money to drink coconut water, by all means, drink coconut water. But I would look at the back of some of those coconut water drinks because I'm pretty sure most of them have a whole lot of crap added to them. They're not straight out of the coconut, as you do in the islands. Come on. Oh. Yeah. Right. Oh, kia ora katoa, um, mō taringa uh, are -are mai ki ahu e kōrero uh, roa nei ki a koutou. Uh, ko te tūmanako, ka u koutou ki nga mahi. Ka ue wariwari ki o mahi kainga. Ka ue wariwari ki nga uh, assessments. Ka u koutou ki tērā. Uh, ka kitea koutou 